After shocking the world by assaulting the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese forces quickly moved to conquer the US-controlled Philippines. This was their only chance to seize the entirety of the Southwest Pacific and claim the resource-rich Dutch East Indies for themselves. Isolated and weakly armed, General Douglas MacArthur's troops in the Philippines were suddenly overwhelmed by a superior force. Still, Japan was gravely mistaken if it believed the US would relinquish the precious archipelago and its 7,100 islands without a fight. The Empire had to pay with blood for every inch of land gained as they slowly pushed the American south to the Bataan Peninsula. Then, a month into the invasion, the defenders had a glimpse of hope when they achieved the impossible, stopping a major offensive at the Orion Baga Line. Humiliated, Lieutenant General Masahiro Homa had to live with the shame of becoming the first Japanese commander to be defeated in the Pacific War. Suddenly, eradicating the U.S. opposition in the islands became a matter of personal honor. As it was foretold. Frustrated by years of feeling belittled and smothered by the U.S. expansion in the Pacific and their unwillingness to sell them off to fuel their war against China, the Japanese finally snapped and decided to take on the slumbering giant head-on. Initially, the Japanese campaign was devastating and inefficient in its advance in the Southeast Pacific. Meanwhile, the Americans, having been drastically pulled into the war, were unprepared and weakened to contend with the mighty Japanese Empire. Still, by 1941, the Philippine scouts were already an elite and highly trained military unit and a proud entity of the U.S. military. And after years of growing tensions stemming from the Sino-Japanese War and Japan's expansionist ambitions, the Americans built up their positions in the Philippine Islands. To contend with the looming imperial threat, the U.S. military came out with War Plan Orange 3, or WPO3, a scheme that foresaw a possible clash between America and Japan. The plan was a masterfully crafted and brutally candid strategic analysis that accurately projected many of the tactics the Japanese might employ and suggested the most ideal responses the U.S. forces should take into action. The plan also predicted the possibility of losing the Philippines and how the U.S. forces would have to lead a defensive effort from the region of Bataan before retreating off the island. But as the hypothesis became a reality and the invading forces closed in on the Philippines, the defending commander, General Douglas MacArthur, decided to disregard WPO3. He had a more aggressive plan of his own. An overconfident general. War Plan Orange 3 boldly anticipated the defeat of the U.S. forces in the Philippines if the Japanese were to attack. The scheme clearly stated that the Americans needed to gather supplies and retreat to the Bataan Peninsula, where they would hold their positions for as long as it took until the U.S. Navy came to the rescue. MacArthur didn't like the idea of retreating, and he was confident that the forces he had assembled, combined with a more aggressive strategy, would lead to a favorable outcome for the U.S. forces. In July of 1941, MacArthur persuaded President Franklin D. Roosevelt to abandon War Plan Orange 3 and embrace the full defense of the Philippines. He argued that the lush forests, mountainous terrain, and the aircraft's inability to land in most of the islands would allow for, quote, a theater of operations in which a defensive force of only moderate efficiency and strength could test the capabilities of the most powerful and splendidly equipped army that could be assembled here. As such, instead of gathering supplies and preparing for a massive withdrawal to Bataan, MacArthur held his ground. December 8, 1941, would come to be known as MacArthur's Pearl Harbor. Swift Japanese preemptive attacks overwhelmed Clark Field Base, where the Japanese found more than half of MacArthur's warplanes exposed and lightly defended. Japan obliterated the U.S. air capabilities in the region, and MacArthur failed to deliver an immediate counterstrike. By December 9th, the U.S. had lost air superiority in the Philippines, and with that, the ability to defend the region. Still, in what is widely considered an extraordinary lapse of reason, MacArthur decided to continue defending the archipelago and fighting off several minor Japanese landings. But the brewing storm could not be undone, and on December 20th, 
USS Stingray spotted 85 troop transports, two battleships, six cruisers, and two dozen destroyers approaching the Philippines. Lieutenant General Masaharu Homa's landing force had arrived. Defensive layers. Despite eight years of training, the US-led forces in the Philippines were mostly unprepared to face the mighty Japanese army, which had been battle-hardened in China. MacArthur had a force of 12,000 troops, most of them Filipino servicemen who had never experienced war in their lives. As Homa's 14th Area Army, made up of over 75,000 experienced troopers, landed in Lingayen Gulf on December 22nd, most of the defenders reeled before the overwhelming air-supported advance executed by the Japanese. The landings were remarkably successful, with the Japanese quickly finishing off any U.S. naval and aerial assets, and effectively isolating the U.S. forces from any outside support. As the gravity of the situation dawned on MacArthur, he decided to fall back to War Plan Orange 3 and began the retreat to the Bataan Peninsula. However, WPO3 required months of preparation. Following the plan he had previously ignored, MacArthur ordered his troops to set up five defensive lines extending from mid Luzon all the way to the entrance of the peninsula. To achieve this, Major General Jonathan Mayhew Wainwright IV was tasked with holding the Layak Line, the first line of defense right after the Japanese occupied beachheads. Thanks to formidable U.S. artillery crews, Wainwright was able to hold back the Japanese for several hours. Still, a coordinated Japanese warplane and tank assault eventually routed the Filipino infantry and left the artillery exposed. The fierce battle was the first time Japanese and American troops faced each other on the ground, but the Americans had no way of containing the Japanese onslaught. In the late hours of December 23rd, Wainwright telephoned General MacArthur to tell him that any further defense of the Lingayen beaches was, quote, impracticable. The Japanese now marched toward the undefended Filipino capital, while the U.S. troops fell back to their defensive lines outside Bataan, preparing for the battle to come. A Retreating Fight U.S. military personnel soon abandoned Manila and retreated south. The capital was declared an open city, and it would offer no resistance to the invading Japanese. The bulk of MacArthur's force was moved from the Luzon Central Plain to Bataan, while some smaller U.S. forces remained to slow down the Japanese and give more time to the defensive lines in the south. The Japanese began their march to Bataan in January, and the U.S. defensive lines began to subside one by one, unable to contain the brutal air raids. WPO3 called for two defensive lines across Bataan, and the defenders hastily set up the Abukayamoban line just before the Japanese conducted their first attack on January 9th. Lieutenant General Susumu Morioka targeted the eastern flank of the defensive line, but the 91st Division of Brigadier General Luther Stevens and Colonel George S. Clark's 57th Infantry managed to repel the initial strike. The deed was partly achieved because of the brave actions of 2nd Lieutenant Alexander R. Nininger, who infiltrated into a heavily defended enemy position and, using only his rifle and hand grenades, neutralized the Japanese hiding in several foxholes. Nininger lost his life during the encounter, but allowed his unit to recapture the Abukai Hacienda. Meanwhile, Filipino soldier Narciso Ortilano used his water-cooled machine gun to shred through dozens of Japanese soldiers. When the weapon was jammed, he continued fighting with his Colt 45 neutralizing five more enemy attackers. Nininger and Ortilano eventually received the Medal of Honor and the Distinguished Service Cross, respectively, for their actions. The line was held for several days, but the perimeter was pierced on January 16th, when the Japanese invaded through a gap that the U.S. commanders believed was unassailable. By the 22nd, the Abukayamoban line had been abandoned. The U.S.-led forces desperately scrambled to put together a last defensive wall in the form of the Orion Baga line, but the effort was plagued by disarray and panic as thousands of troops were still retreating from the north. Still, the Americans and the Filipinos fought bravely, even as food and water dwindled and the men started to fall to disease. <laughs> 
The resistance was so fierce on February 8th that Hama was forced to halt the advance and regroup his forces. At that moment, the Allies could finally take a breath, although the worst was yet to come. I shall return. As the 14th Army was forced to withdraw a few miles to the north, the Allied forces retook crucial territory, and the resistance proved to be a significant and humiliating setback for Homa. By then, MacArthur was now seen as a war hero in his own right. As such, the Washington High Command resolved to safeguard the general's security, and seeing how the situation in Bataan was growing more desperate each day, Roosevelt ordered MacArthur to flee to Australia and take command of the forces in the Southwest Pacific. The general refused to leave and opted to stay with his men, but he was nonetheless forced to flee. On the night of March 12th, MacArthur and other staff officers left the stronghold on the island of Corregidor and sailed to Mindanao aboard PT boats, from where the U.S. still had hopes to execute a counterattack. Eventually, however, the general irremediably departed from the Philippines and was taken to Australia. Once there, the general addressed the Filipinos through a moving radio speech, foretelling the eventual liberation of the Philippines and the triumph of America over Japan. He swore, quote, I shall return. Last Stand The Allies were left under the command of Lieutenant General Wainwright, while the Japanese sent reinforcements for a final assault. The 1st Artillery Headquarters, under Major General Kaneo Karajima, strengthened their forces with 190 artillery pieces, including 150mm cannons and the rare Type 45 240mm howitzer. The invaders launched a brutal attack on the Orion Baga line on April 3rd, turning Mount Samat into an inferno. Homa initially estimated that it would take them a week to breach the first line and a month to destroy another two. The Japanese finally captured Mount Samat, while the devastated remnants of the defense crumpled to the rear. The American and Filipino troops tried to hold their positions during Easter weekend, but every counterattack they launched was futile. As General Jonathan Wainwright highlighted, quote, the Philippine army units were doomed before they started to fight. That they lasted as long as they did is a stirring and touching tribute to their gallantry and fortitude. They never had a chance to win. The Bataan defenses fell 123 days after the start of the battle. The U.S. and Filipino troops had been fighting for months, but their lines were now pierced, isolated, and uncommunicated. The commanders on the peninsula lost all contact with their units, leaving them vulnerable to capture. The Allied defense continued to disintegrate for a couple of days, as the formation collapsed and roads were clogged with refugees and fleeing troops. On April 9th, Major General Edward P. King was forced to capitulate and negotiate the terms of surrender. That day, an announcement was radioed from Corregidor, quote, Bataan has fallen, but the spirit that made it stand, a beacon to all the liberty-loving peoples of the world, cannot fall. Aftermath The fall of Bataan was the most significant surrender in U.S. military history, and what came next was one of the most gruesome chapters of the Pacific War. Following the fall of Bataan, no less than 64,000 Filipino and 12,000 American soldiers laid down their arms and became prisoners of a nation that only had the ability to care for about 30,000. As such, over 70,000 prisoners suffered from food and supply shortages, in addition to the hostile jungle environment and the violent treatment of their captors. The flood of captives was then forced to march from Mariveles, the tip of the Bataan Peninsula, to Camp O'Donnell, where they would have to await the end of the war. Countless men lost their lives due to fatigue, malnutrition, or disease during the so-called Bataan Death March and many more lost their lives at the hands of the merciless victors. As Lieutenant Colonel Masanobu Suji would reckon, quote, this is the way to treat bastards like this. Others, however, managed to escape and regroup into guerrilla units, but it wouldn't be until 1945 that MacArthur would be able to fulfill his promise and liberate the Philippines 
finally releasing his men from the brutal treatment of the captors. After the war, many Japanese officials were tried for their crimes. One of them was General Masaharu Homa, who was found guilty and subsequently executed. Thank you for watching Dark Ducks. Please give us a like and check out the rest of our Dark Documentaries channels for many more epic stories from modern history. Also, click on the bell icon to get notifications about our newest content, and stay tuned for more.